Okay, we want to welcome you to our Polar Connect event. Um, we're excited to be with uh, an alumni, uh, Polar Trek alumni, Elizabeth Eubanks and her exposition team. Um, and they are calling in from Costa Rica today. She'll tell us why she's in Costa Rica and what the connection is to the polar world in a little bit. It's Wednesday, October 17, 2012. And uh, this event is being hosted by the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States in Fairbanks, Alaska. A few things that we're going to um, explain to you here in the next few slides. The first one being about the platform we're using. It's called Blackboard Collaborate. And as you get settled in wherever you are, um, you can see that uh, slides should be changing in the center of your screen. And um, a number of other features with Blackboard Collaborate are that we have a webcam with Elizabeth today. She's the only one that we're going to, uh, um, well her and the team will be the only ones that will be showing up through that video today. Um, and then um, we have a list of participants down below them. You can see who else has joined us, all the classrooms and other people. And then we have a chat area. In this chat area, you can type in your questions. You can see that people are saying hello. And in a little bit, we'll have you introduce yourselves and where you're from and how many people are with you today. Um, if you have any trouble as we go along where the things are not working for you, first try um, sending Sarah and myself, Janet, a quick message in the chat area, and we'll try to fix it as we go along. Um, otherwise, sometimes it's just easy to just go back out of Blackboard Collaborate and come back in and that might resolve itself. This event is being archived and we'll send it out after the event as well as post it on the website. So speaking of participants and introducing yourselves, this is a great time to use that chat area. Um, please type in who you are, your school, your institution, and if you've got students, and just gives us a sense of where people are coming from. Um, so before I turn it over to Elizabeth, I mentioned that she was a Polar Trek alumni, and Polar Trek stands for Teachers and Researchers Exploring and Collaborating. It's a mouthful if you say it really fast. Um, but this is a program that's funded by the National Science Foundation, and our goal is to place teachers like Elizabeth with researchers such as Dr. Oberbauer, who will in, be introduced in a little bit, um, for research experiences in the polar regions. We send teachers to the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, again, we're going to learn about Costa Rica today, but um, I'm sure Elizabeth will explain um, the connections to the polar regions and how she got connected with Steve Oberbauer. Um, and we're funded for until um, 2014, and um, we hope to uh, continue after that. But if you're interested in, in Polar Trek, there's lots of other uh, webinars and other activities through our website that you can learn more about the polar regions. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth, and when she turns on her mic, oh, Elizabeth, you can just tell us when you're ready to change slides, um, or if you end up wanting to do it yourself, you're welcome to do that, but sometimes it's easier to have us do it. Um, and uh, we'll just let you uh, take it over from here. So welcome. Hi, so good morning. It's about 11.37 here in Costa Rica. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side, I was with Dr. Oberbauer and Paolo in 2008 in Barrow, Alaska. And um, Dr. Oberbauer is so wonderful that he wanted to perpetuate this relationship because he really feels that it's important to have community outreach. Um, through the National Science Foundation, they really want researchers to make a broader impact. And in doing so, he decided to have me come to Costa Rica so that I could share what I'm doing here and what all the, actually not what I'm doing here, but really what all the researchers are doing here at this great little place called La Salva in Costa Rica. Um, La Salva is actually run by the Organization for Tropical Studies, and Dr. Oberbauer is going to tell you a little bit about that. I'm going to try and move my slide, but it didn't work, so if you could do that for me, that would be great. Oh, I see. 
So um, as you can see, Barrow is a very, very long way to Sarapaki. How do you say that? Sarapaki. Sarapaki, Costa Rica. And Dr. Oberbauer and I, fortunately, both live in Florida. So you can sort of see where we make our stopover in Florida. And then we come all the way down to Costa Rica. But I just wanted the visual for you to see how far we're talking about here. Looks like right there. Okay. So um, this is La Salva. And I've kind of honed in a little bit. Um, if you look at the map, you can see where I am. And I keep pointing to the map, but it's not, I guess you can't see that. Um, we also have some other people at our school, St. Mark, who have an affiliation with this region. So their little pictures are on the screen as well. Um, I've spent time with tons and tons of researchers here. And I'm finding that I really love their stories. Oops. In the very center, you're going to see Diego. And Diego will be presenting in a little while. Diego is on the top of a Carbono a Tower, which is about how high? Uh, oops, um, yes. About 44 meters. About 44 meters. Um, if you look over to your right, you will see a gentleman looking at his watch. Uh, Elizabeth? Yes. Just slow down a little bit. Yeah, slow down for a moment. You sound like a mouse, and uh, I may disconnect your audio. Yeah, slow down for a moment. You sound like a mouse, and uh, I may disconnect your audio and put it back on again. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me a little better now? Okay. Try again. Okay. Try again. Okay. So in the center, you will see Diego, who I've spent most of my time with. Diego is on the top of a Carbono Tower, the Carbono Tower. And it's about how high, Diego? 44 meters. About 44 meters. And Diego is actually going to be doing a presentation today. So I'll hold off on him. The gentleman over to the right that's looking at his watch is Jim Zook. And Jim is a birder here in Costa Rica. He came here many years ago with the Peace Corps and wound up staying. And he probably knows, well, he knows every bird by sight and sound in Costa Rica, which is quite an advantage. The young lady over to the left is a very interesting girl. She studies orb weaver spiders, which we have in Florida. She is also a pet sitter for bats right now. So I got to do two things with her. Right below her is a gentleman named Carlos De La Rosa. And he is the director here at La Salva. And if you check my website, I have made a video of him and his wife. And there will be another one to come of what he's doing here. Way over to the right, you're also going to see the spider girl. Her name is Megan. And in the top hand corner is the girl um, Sabina, I believe her name is. And she is the one that actually has the bats. But she's not in town right now. In the center, you're going to find Dr. Oberbauer. He's the gentleman in the blue shirt, smiling. Yes, they're all smiling. And then the guy in the red shirt is Dave Genero. And he and the guy next to him, Dr. Chris Osborne, are from NC, NSCU, North Carolina State University. So they're all working on a project together as well that Dr. Oberbauer is going to tell you about. Next slide, please. So this is insanely crazy. Um, I have only been here for, this is my seventh day now. And the species that I have seen are a bit overwhelming. Um, in my next slide, you're going to see everything that I've seen in the animal kingdom, which I am still blown away. On our way over here, I think we saw two other things that are going to be added to the list. So it's insane. Not to mention all the things that I forgot to record. Um, but if you look at the species, they're just gorgeous. And I think one thing that really surprised me is that when you get into the jungle and into the forest, it's all green. You see flashes of red, a little bit of yellow. But with all these colorful species, I really expected to see more color in the jungle other than them. It would seem like they would stick out, but they really don't. So um, anyway, we can go to the next slide. And I feel very overwhelmed even looking at this, because this is a lot of species. Um, this is just the kingdom animalia. If I had to add the plants on there, it would, I, I don't even know if I could list everything that I've seen. Um, last night, Diego and I and a few people took a walk, a night walk, and we saw a bioluminescent, which means glowing, basically fungus. So it's, the life here is incredible, very exciting. Next slide, please. 
I had to add this crazy, crazy critter. Um, it could be a sphinx moth, moth or a hawk moth, a caterpillar, but it's insane because it really looks like a venomous snake. Um, and that the side that you're looking at on the left is actually its backside. So the other side that's kind of whitish, if it's draped across the branch, well, it just looks like a bit of poop. So it's the, like I said, the creatures here are amazing. Their adaptations are amazing. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to let Dr. Oberbauer share with you a little bit about La Salva. Um, and I'm very glad to be here. And that's it. My gratitude is deep. So as Elizabeth said, La Selva Biological Station is owned and operated by the Organization for Tropical Studies, which is a group of universities in the U.S. and in Costa Rica and some other countries, as well as federal agencies like the U.S. Forest Service and the Smithsonian Institution that got together to uh, try to promote research and teaching in the tropics. La Selva was originally a farm that was started in the 1960s by a famous uh, scientist, Les Holdridge. So this was his farm, and he grew chocolate, and he grew peach palms on the property. And then as time went on, a group, the OTS formed, and they thought, well, this would be a good place to establish a field station. So they bought the farm from Dr. Holdridge, and they uh, established the field station in what was his old house, which when I first started coming here was just a little house, and there was a tiny little space that we used as a lab. And uh, there would often be very few researchers here back then, but now La Selva sometimes will have 150 people here. We also have uh, tour groups that come here, but right now mostly we have a great many courses that come here also, as well as the researchers that are based here like Diego and myself. I don't live here, but I come here fairly often. Uh, La Selva has a long history of being on the cutting edge of tropical research. And that picture that you see of me crossing that bridge, that bridge really was one of the big advances. Because before that bridge, we had to take a canoe, uh, a motorized canoe, up from a town that was about four miles away, drive up the river, and then get off at the station. It was quite uh, rustic. Uh, La Selva is really uh, one of the, it's, it's famous actually. When Elizabeth said, well, this, this little place, but it's actually not that little. It's one of the top two probably tropical research stations in the world. And uh, some of you may or may not remember that movie, The Medicine Man with Sean Connery. But in that, they, he asked this young woman if he had, she had any tropical experience. And she said, oh, I spent a month at La Selva. So, They've used uh, La Selva in uh, the Apocalypto. Some of that movie was shown, uh, was taken at La Selva. And uh, this, a new movie by Will Smith was just partly filmed here as well. Uh, La Selva is really mostly known for long-term studies of how the tropics function, how about diversity, about how the tropical forests might respond to climate change. And uh, it's really one of the main places to go. Uh, when you look at the map now, uh, La Selva has about 1,600 hectares now. So you think, what is a hectare? A hectare is two and a half acres. So it's something over something like uh, almost uh, 4,000 acres or so of forest. And when you look at that map, the dark green forest is forest that is what's called old growth forest. It has never been cut. Um, much of the area around La Selva has been uh, cut down. Uh, the forest has been cut down and converted either to pastures or banana plantations. Another big uh, thing going on here now are pineapple plantations. So when you go to the grocery store and buy a pineapple, there's a really good chance it came from this region in Costa Rica. So La Selva started out uh, the small 
the half on the right side of the picture was the original Salva, and then as time went on, uh, OTS was able to buy other pieces of property, partly because we wanted to be able to do research in areas where we could manipulate it. So we could cut down trees and see what happens when a gap opens up in the forest or not. So the the site is designed to promote research, not only study in old growth forests, but also in in forest fragments, which is what much of the tropics are in now, and even in agricultural areas. The project that I'm involved in right now, aside from the one that Elizabeth is participating in for the outreach part, is this project that you're seeing us sampling water in streams. And it turns out, and maybe you know this, but we should all know this, but the Costa Rica is part of the Pacific Rim, and the center part of Costa Rica is a big ridge along a continental, uh, an earth plate. And those plates are volcanically active, so the central part of Costa Rica is volcanically active. And it also, in the tropics and high elevations, the higher you go up in the mountains, the more rainfall you get. So here at La Selva, we get four meters of rain, or about 12 feet of rain. But if you go up in the mountains, they get as much as 10 meters of rain, which would be something like 30 feet of rain. Well, where does all that water go? It runs down in rivers, but some of it percolates into the ground and recharges underground water resources called aquifers. And that water runs down the mountains and then comes up underneath in the lowlands, like at La Selva. So the pictures you see us sampling there, that some of these streams, the water that's coming out of the streams is actually coming from below and not coming in from rainfall right here, but it's rainfall that's come down from the mountains dozens of miles away. And we're interested in that water because that water is also removing a lot of uh, carbon, which is you know, one of the major components of the carbon cycle and the greenhouse gas issue that is going on in the world. So this carbon is moving from the mountains as carbon dioxide, which would be dissolved inorganic carbon, or DIC, or it's, some of it is coming down from the mountains as uh, dissolved organic carbon, which is uh, carbon in things like uh, broken down leaves or broken down organic matter. That carbon, the DIC, leaves the streams as carbon dioxide. So when we're down here in the lowlands trying to understand, well, what's the balance of carbon dioxide? What's the balance of greenhouse gases for our area here? We have to account for this carbon dioxide that's coming in from up in the mountains, dozens of miles away. And this carbon dioxide is coming from volcanoes. So it's a little bit complicated. And we bit off more than we chew, could chew originally because we didn't know about this. And so I'm trying to understand how the forests are taking up carbon dioxide in photosynthesis and how much is leaving the system in respiration. And it turns out a whole lot is leaving the system in the streams. Some of it is coming in from the mountains, but a lot of the carbon is leaving our system as dissolved organic carbon when the leaves fall from the trees and they break down and they end up dissolved in the water and then the water is leaving the stream. So my system, that tower that Elizabeth mentioned, is measuring carbon going in and out of the forest, but carbon is also coming in and out of the forest through the streams. Carbon is coming from the mountains below in the water, and carbon is leaving the system out in the streams. Uh, you're looking at David Genero here in the red shirt, and what you're looking at there is a weir, W-E-I-R. A weir is an area where you can measure the flow of a stream. And so it's basically like a an impoundment is like a dam, but it's not really a dam. And then there's a V notch. So you can see that V notch, where the red line is, that's a very sharp aluminum 
metal facing on that cement. And if we know the height of the water behind that weir, then we can say what the flow rate is. And if we know the flow rate, if we know the rate, and over a time period, we can calculate how much water is going up. And this is how David knows that there's three times, three times as much water leaving that stream that you're looking at there is coming from below the forest and up from the volcanoes than the water that's coming in in the watershed, that is the area where rainfall is collected and comes down in that stream. It's, there's only one-fourth of the water in that watershed is coming in from rainfall. And three-quarters is coming in from this water coming up from the volcanoes. Pretty crazy. Somebody was asking um, Dr. Erberbauer if you knew the pH of the water. The pH of the water is different depending on whether we have this water coming from below or whether the water is coming uh, from the rain. So the, we just were out sampling this morning and the pH of a stream not affected by this groundwater was about 6.5 or so and some of the pHs we're seeing in some other streams is 4.5 or so. But they tend to be fairly uh, different. The chemical composition of that water is very easy to tell from regular rainfall water. So if you measure uh, how salty the water is, the water coming from the mountains is more salty because it's washed through all of these volcano-laden uh, uh, stones and rocks and materials up in the mountains, and it's dissolving all of this stuff when it comes down. So it's pretty easy to tell by its chemical signature. What you're looking at now are, is a Carbono Tower, which Carbono is just Spanish for carbon. And uh, the Carbono project is measuring how much carbon dioxide the forest is taking out of the atmosphere, which is a good thing. We want to lower the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because CO2 is a greenhouse gas and it's responsible for global warming. But the forests also give off carbon when they respire. At night, of course, plants are in the dark. They're not photosynthesizing. They're not using sunlight to make sugars, so at night they have to burn the sugars they made, just like we burn the food we eat. They are respiring and giving off carbon dioxide. So the instruments we have on the top of the tower, which is above the canopy there, allows us to measure the balance of carbon dioxide going into the forest as opposed to the balance of carbon dioxide going out of the forest. And like I said, the problem we have is that some of this carbon now we've discovered is coming in to the system from the volcanoes and some of the carbon that we thought was working is going out of the system. And <laughs> this is the surprise slide. I am married to a tropical biologist. Her name is Maureen Donnelly. She's a dean at our university. And she's also a herpetological expert, so she knows frogs and lizards and snakes. And she is co-author of the book, The Amphibians and Reptiles of La Selva. And this is a picture of her in one of her favorite places, San Francisco, California. And she's a very funny lady. <laughs> I had to add her, Dr. Eberbauer, because when I looked at, I was telling Diego, the scientists that I've met here on this trip are mainly male. And so I thought your wife was a really good advocate that there are more. And Diego said that when we are in season, it's almost very balanced. But right now, I only have Megan. No, so. mostly in the summertime, there's more women here than men, generally. And so if you were a young bachelor, you might be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> as, as Elizabeth said, I met my wife here in 1981. And, uh, and she calls it jungle love. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're going to Okay. You can introduce. Okay, now we're going to have Diego Dierick. He is a postdoctoral scientist. He comes originally from Belgium, but he got his doctorate degree in Germany, and he is a key component of all of the research that we're doing here in Costa Rica. Take it away, Diego. Hi. Um, 
as uh, Steve mentioned, my name is Diego, and I've been lucky enough to be able to be at La Selva for the last two and a half years, but pretty much continuously working on a project called Verano. Maybe we can pull up the next slide. Yeah, just tell them. Yeah. Or you can tell. Oh, there it is. So um, we work on a project called Verano, and Verano that actually means uh, that it's Spanish for summer, and we'll get to that why. And what we are looking at is uh, tree growth and how it relates to environmental factors. So you all know that trees grow from these little seedlings on the forest floor to these big giant trees in the forest. But if you look at it in a bit more detail, and I put on the right-hand slide, I put um, a little graph of a single tree and how it grows to time. And if you look on the graph, you'll see that from a tree we've been following for over two years now, and then you see that from 2010 to 2012, it grew about three centimeters. But what is more important to note there, that is that tree is not, that tree is not growing continuously. It grows at, at times it grows a bit faster, other times it grows a bit slower. And then you can start wondering how that comes, and that is exactly what we want to look into. So there's a lot of factors that influence tree growth. There is the species and the competition, if it is shaded out, if it's in the understory, in the overstory. We're not as much into that. We are more in the environmental factors that drive it. So that could be temperature, air temperature, air humidity. I indicated a few factors on the left-hand side. But more important to us, and that is exactly what we are looking into, precipitation water availability. How does that influence tree growth, and in particular in the dry season in the summer? So that is where, where the name comes from, the name Verano comes from. Um, maybe we can move on to the next slide now. Can you talk a little slower? Okay. And how do we have a look at the effect of um, precipitation? Well, there's the best way to, to get to it, actually, is to start manipulating factors. So what we set up is an experiment where we actually control um, water availability precipitation in the dry season, which is for us January to, to end of April. So I showed the concept there. What we have that is that in tree sites in mature forest, in the old growth forest, Steve showed it on the, on the map of La Salva, we selected three sites there. And in each of the sites, we set up two plots. One is a control plot, which is actually exposed to ambient conditions. There we don't manipulate water availability or precipitation. Another plot, and you always find them paired, in each side you have control and treatment. The other plot is the treatment plot, and that is actually where we are um, manipulating the amount of precipitation coming in. So what we have there is precipitation plus added irrigation. So we have three plots, uh, three sides with two plots, treatment control. All of them are about 900 square meters. So that would be in acres. Mm, yeah, more than an acre, I think. Uh, probably a bit more than an acre. No, anyway, well, 900 square meter. Um, an anyway, that accounts for about 25 large trees, which we will follow. And what we do there, that is irrigate from January to end of April in the treatment plots. Um, and in the next slide, we'll show how to go ahead with the irrigation work, because that is something. Um, in the end, what one has there is sprinklers, pretty much like you would uh, get them in your garden center at Home Depot. Um, so that is pr simple sprinklers. We have about thir 13 of them in each of the treatment plots. Then we have a, a gasoline pump, which will pump up water from a nearby stream and push it through to the sprinklers. And we have a little flow meter, which always allows us to get some feedback on how we are doing, how many water are we actually putting on these plots. And so what we do that is between January and end of April, Depending on the rain that came in in the 24 hours pre um, that passed, depending on that amount of rain that came in, we will add a little bit. And we'll make sure that we always get to at least 10 millimeters a day. So whenever rain, if we don't have rain, we put on 10 millimeters. If we have a bit of rain, we will put 8 or 7 millimeters of water on the plots. Um, over 900 square meters, 10 millimeters per day, that corresponds to 9,000 liters. So that's about 2,500 gallons or something. So that is a decent amount of water we put on there. So, and in these plots, what do we look then? Uh, what do we look at? That is what we'll see in the next slide. In the first place, if the next slide, that's the one. 
So in the first place, what we are mainly interested in that is to see control versus treatment plots. How do the trees grow? And to do that, we have on the l in the left-hand corner, the top, um, we have what they call dendrometers. And they are little steel bands which are wrapped around the tree. And um, they are fit snug around the tree with, um, with a spring. Excuse me, um, just to let them know, these are the dendrometers that are in our mangrove park that Dr. Oberbauer and Dr. Olivis put in. Yeah, that's the same system. So there are little steel bands with two scales on them. And if the tree grows, the steel band settles and the scales slide one versus the other. And every month, someone goes out and checks all these trees. So in total, that is about 120 trees we follow. And that gives us data on growth of all these trees in the treatment plots, in the control plots. Then we have things where we look at um, root growth. How do the roots do? And is there any difference between tree between treatment and controls. We look at soil respiration um, to see what is going on in the underground compartment. Soil humidity, that gives us an idea how successful the treatment is. Do we in indeed increase uh, soil humidity in the plots where we add irrigation? Then we have in the top right hand corner what, uh, what is called a litter trap that is not more than a mesh square um, where you collect all the, the litter that falls down. And they, these are read every two weeks. Someone goes, collects all the litter out. And that gives you an idea on, on leaf shedding. If, if there's, for example, in response to environmental uh, factors, if there's enhanced leaf shedding. And another thing we have a look at that is sap flux. And sap flux tells you a little bit how much water is moving up in the trunk. So um, that gives you an idea on water consumption of the tree. If a tree gets drought stress, then they will reflect in subflux. The tree will reduce its water consumption, and we might be able to see that there if we see a difference between our treatment plots or control plots. Um, if it now happens that the things we follow in these plots do not really explain differences we see in tree growth, then we have an awful lot of other data to rely on. And Steve already mentioned the, the, the canopy towers. So on the next slide, we'll see a canopy tower. And they give us all the data on what is happening in the canopy compartment. So they give us all the information on what does the canopy of a tree or the, the top layer of the forest actually experiences. We get data there on light levels, air temperature, air humidity, uh, wind speed and wind velocity. And so that gives us a detailed idea on what that tree is experiencing and how that impacts what we see on the plots and how that impacts tree growth. Um, and another part, and Steve referred to that one, Steve has a look at um, these carbon movements underground. Another part is, and you see that instrument in the top left corner there, that is what they call um, eddy covariance. That is a system that allows you to measure CO2 exchange between the atmosphere and the forest as an ecosystem. And so that tells us that, well, if everything goes right, that tells us if CO2 is being taken up by the forest or if it's released by the forest. So all in all, um, both the data that comes from our plots as well as the data that comes from our um, canopy towers, I guess there's a pretty good idea of what is going on and how these trees uh, respond, I mean, growth-wise, to all these factors we are looking into. Is that it? That's my part. So you can go to, yes, thank you. Um, and, and thanks to Dr. Oberbauer and Janet and Sarah. And um, of course, Diego. I didn't want to single out him with all the other La Salva people, but I've been with Diego most of the time. And I really appreciate his help and knowledge and great to hang out with, really. <clears throat> so we'll take questions now. OK, um, I'm going to um, talk here. Thanks, I guess, did, did you get the question answered, how high are the towers? Did you? I, I think you said that. It's 44 meters, or they're about 135 feet. So they're like 10 stories high or so. It's pretty scary up there. <laughs> but it's also much cooler and drier. There's a bit of wind, which makes it nice. Okay, so we're looking at the questions, but if I Okay, I'm interrupting you, Elizabeth, so I can give some instructions about how to do questions here. 
So if you um, have questions, um, we'll get to the ones that are all written. Um, but if you have questions that you want to ask live to Elizabeth and the team, please click on the little hand icon above the list of participants and we can call on you and you can ask your questions live. So um, in the meantime, we'll give Elizabeth and the team their audio back <laughs> and um, we'll go through some questions, Elizabeth, that came up while you guys were talking. So. Um, are they there, back on? Yep. There's two questions about the bridge. What was the bridge made of and how high is the stone bridge? Is it made of stone? You could press your top button. Nobody heard that. Can anybody hear us? Hello? Hello, can you hear us? Hello, Elizabeth? There's something weird with their phone. Uh, no, this is Janet and Sarah in um, Alaska. Can you hear us, whoever is talking? Yes. Okay, great. Elizabeth, can you hear us? Okay, we aren't sure why Elizabeth can't hear us. I'm not sure what's going on over there. Maybe they muted their computer. Elizabeth, you got to press the talk button. Oh. I can hear you, but I can't hear Elizabeth, and I couldn't get them online either. Okay, I think we lost you for a second. We're going to go back through the questions. Does the wind really shake the tower? Okay. Not too much, honestly. But I wouldn't be up there if there's strong there gusts of wind. And honestly, we recently had some trouble um, where a big gust of wind damaged one of the towers. So it's probably wise not to be up there when it's real windy. But the, the interesting thing about being on the tower is that when the wind is blowing, the trees are shaking. So the trees are moving, but you're not. But you feel like you're moving because the trees are moving. You get a bit seasick. Can you still hear us, Janet and Sarah? Yes. Can you hear us, mm -hmm. Elizabeth? Elizabeth. I'm not sure if we keep leaving okay. or not. Um, somebody is trying to get hold of Elizabeth, but we need to get feedback. So, um, also, there was a question about the bridge. How tall is the bridge, and what is the bridge made of? Uh, the bridge is about probably 40 feet above the river, but the it's a suspension bridge like the San Francisco. Golden Gate Bridge, so it has towers at the ends, and then the cables hang down in a loop. And those towers are probably about 50 feet high on each end. And then there's a giant block of concrete that anchors the bridge on each end. Uh, the bridge was built in 1981, I think, and it cost then about Two hundred thousand dollars. So probably now it would cost a million dollars. But this is a famous bridge. Every picture of La Selva shows that bridge, and it's a very funny bridge because the animals like to use it to cross the river, and it's very common for monkeys to be on those cables looking at you when you go by. And also, I think I should add, it's super, super, super dark at night. Um, without a flashlight, do your eyes even ever adjust? I don't know. It's so dark, even on the bridge. OK, Elizabeth, we have uh, some questions with Lolly. She wants to, from Red School, they'd like to ask their questions. Go ahead, Red School. Yeah, I might have this. Hello? Hello? 
Janet, can you hear us? Uh, Go ahead. Yes. Uh, okay. All right. Hold on. Here we go. First question. First again. Are you comparing your results from before and Barrow to the results you have now? Did you catch that, Elizabeth? Oh, well, guys, you need to work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, did you guys uh, want? Did you guys hear? Can you hear us? I can hear you, but Elizabeth can't. <laughs> I need to relay some information to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you guys have two computers on. You need to mute one of the um, computer sounds because you're you're causing feedback through the system. Only one computer can be um, um, have the talk button pressed. Okay. Okay. Go. So Elizabeth, can you hear us now? Oh. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. She may not be able to hear you, but we would. We're trying to find Lolly. Lolly, can you hear us? I know your students have some questions. Yeah, we'll let the family talk here in a moment, but yeah. we want to hear from the students. So. Um, Lolly, um, maybe type your question in again, and because we still aren't sure if Elizabeth can uh, hear us or not. So Elizabeth, if you can hear us, give us a thumbs up or something, because I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. So do you want us to hang up, Janet? Uh, no, you're fine. You can still stay there. You're good. Okay. I'm not. Elizabeth, something is going on with the uh, audio. In um, in Costa Rica. Okay, go ahead, Elizabeth. Okay. Are you studying the same thing? In Costa Rica, like Alaska. Video's not working. Uh, we're just getting feedback. So go ahead and just talk. Okay. Go ahead. So yes, uh, what we're doing okay, in Barrel back. and okay, good. Okay, keep going. What we're doing in Barrel and what we're doing here is quite similar. In both cases, we're trying to understand what are the factors that affect the carbon balance of the vegetation. Here, the thing about the tropics that's so important is that they have the potential to do the most photosynthesis of almost any place in the world. So they have the potential to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And so we're trying to understand what factors affect tree growth, which is the way the trees are, that's where the carbon is going. When trees grow, they're putting that carbon in wood. So we're trying to understand where the you know how much carbon is going into wood, and so if the trees are growing well, then we're storing a lot of carbon. The situation in Alaska is the opposite. In Alaska, there's a lot of stored carbon in the soil that's there 
because it's cold and it's wet and the microbes that live in the soil cannot break down the sugars and good stuff in the soil that they would like to eat because it's too cold and it's too wet and when it's wet there's not enough oxygen for them to breathe. So in Alaska the worry is that the respiration, the loss of carbon will be very high if it warms and gets dry up there. Whereas here we're worried, we're looking into how much photosynthesis the forest is taking up as it's warming. And it is warming here. It's not sure that it's going to get wetter or drier, but it's definitely warming here. So we're comparing kind of how much photosynthesis the forest is taking up here compared to how much carbon, how much respiration is going on compared to photosynthesis in the tundra. Both of these two areas, the tundra and the tropics, are really the places where we need to be devoting our efforts into understanding how climate change will affect the vegetation. Okay, um, thanks a lot, okay, uh, Steve. Um, we're going to go to Phil's uh, class to, and then we'll go uh, back to uh, Lily's class in a moment. Okay, can you hear us? All right, go ahead, Carlos, ask the question. What's your favorite animal and describing it? They wanted to know what, what animal you saw while, while you were on expedition um, that was your favorite. Go ahead. We're going to let Steve answer that one. This is his space. My favorite animal here is the great green macaw. It's a tremendous bird. They're absolutely gorgeous. When they fly over you, you know they're there because they're so loud. They are, you can hear them for miles. And they're very rare. They're the, this species is not doing very well. There's not very many in the world. But when they fly over you, they're beautiful green. But when we're up on the tower and they fly below us, it turns out that their backs are iridescent blue. It's almost blinding. They're so beautiful. They are noisy and tremendous, rare, and beautiful birds all at the same time. And my favorite creature that I found here is in the lower left corner. And it has to be the leaf cutter ant. They're unbelievably amazing. And if I were young, perhaps I would study them. They just walk around in these perfect little pads carrying leaves. And Diego has said that he's even seen them carrying flowers, which just must look wonderful. Diego? I would probably go for the little white tan bats. There's this little kind of bat here, which um, eats away the, the, the rib of a leaf and then the leaf collapses and they use it as a little tent to house under and then you find them very often, well, if you fi happen to find them then you find them with, with like a little group, three to seven or something in this little tent and they look like a little cotton ball, they're very cute, they look, look like they're white, they look like a cotton ball with a little yellow nose sticking out of them. I think these are my favorites. <laughs> Okay, good fun. Um, so I think Lolly has some more questions. Go ahead, Lolly. Okay, hold on. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. How long will it take to grow trees in your experiment? Okay. Go ahead, Elizabeth. How long will it take to grow trees in your experiment? We're turned on now. If you go back to Steve's slide, I think there's some pictures of the trees he planted too. Go ahead. So trees grow very fast here in Costa Rica. Right now the study that we're doing is actually based on trees that are naturally growing there in the forest. But if you plant trees, they grow very fast. So a, 
some trees grow very fast, like a balsa wood tree could be 15 feet in maybe a year and a half. And in five years, it could be probably a foot in diameter and uh, maybe 70 or 80 feet tall. They grow very fast. If you look on the slide that you're seeing now, the one behind the picture looking down at me, down on the tower, the big tree behind that, underneath the thing that says tree Dr. Overbauer planted in 1979, that tree is probably about a yard in diameter. So it's, you know, for many of you, if you put your arms out, that's as wide as you can put your arms out. That tree is just over 30 years old. And it's already well over 100 feet tall and almost probably a yard in diameter. And I planted that as a tiny little seedling in 1979. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. How about uh, uh, questions? We have another question. Go ahead. What was your best or fun experience there in Costa Rica? So Elizabeth, you guys can answer that. What was your best or your funnest experience in Costa Rica? Fun experience in Costa Rica. Are you guys there in Costa Rica? Are you thinking about it? There we go. Sorry. Um, I think that it's too hard for me to answer that question because I've only been here for a week and everything has been so much fun and so much almost as equal to all the life that I've seen. So um, I'll be trying to work on a journal or something and then Diego comes by and pushes a little buzzer and says, I have to go to one of the towers. And so then we just kind of run off. And so I think walking on the boardwalk at night and looking at bioluminescent fungi or the weird snake-like thing or seeing all of the birds has been amazing. I, but you know, now that I think of it, the most, what I really enjoyed are hearing everybody's stories and looking at their research because um, everybody's got a story and they want to share it. And, and I love the stories, especially some of these people that have been here forever. Um, so I love the stories. Do you guys have something that you that stands out in your mind? Best experience in Costa Rica? One thing I liked a lot, one, one thing that happened once, there was a um, bus on the bridge and there was a slot trying to cross the bridge over the cable, so the slots will typically walk on the underside of the cable. And there was a porcupine, we have We lost you. Press the top button one more time. Uh, so one thing I liked, one experience, a personal one, which, which I liked a lot, that was when I was passing at night on the on the bridge. And at night there's quite some traffic there of animals. Steve already mentioned it. And at one point there was both a slot and a porcupine uh, trying to walk over, but the slot was quite slow. And uh, the porcupine t tried to take over the slot on the cable. And then... Uh, it was fun to see how he tried it, doubted a little bit, then tried to go ahead anyway, because the slot is normally climbing over on the underside of the cable, and the porcupine walks on top. And the porcupine decided to go ahead, and the slot tried to to grab it, tried to get it off the cable there. That was fun. I liked that one. Okay, Steve, do you have one? Yeah, well, a very fun event happened just the other night when we said we hadn't seen any snakes. Mm -hmm. the whole time we were here. And then 10 minutes later, we were walking back to the cabinas, and one of the two guys that you saw the pictures working on the groundwater project said, 
oh my gosh, this is the biggest snake I've ever seen. And there was a big snake crossing the trail. It was so big, it went both sides. It was over the trail on both ends. And they said, oh man, that snake, come look at it. And uh, by the time I got there, it had crawled in a hole under the trail. And we have two, two poisonous snake types here that people are very scared of. And they thought, well, maybe that's what this snake was. But they got a picture, and it turned out to be a boa constrictor, a big boa, which probably, you know, you can buy those in the pet store, but they can get very big. But uh, the look on these guys' face uh, <laughs> when they saw that snake, and they were terrified to walk over the step, over the sidewalk because the snake was under the sidewalk in a hole somewhere. That was pretty fun. Except for it was right outside of my casa. Um, the one guy went and got a machete and tore down the plant. But um, it looks like we have some questions from St. Mark. And they were wondering about the birds. And um, I'm not sure what they were wondering. If they could ask a specific question, that would be very helpful. Um, as far as the climbing gear, there's not so much. It's just a harness um, that attaches to a cable in the middle of the tower. And then, of course, a hard hat. I don't know if there are lemurs here, but I no, there are not. And I haven't seen any for that reason. And then another question was about, um, I have seen probably birds. I'm reading the questions. I've probably, well, the other day when I went out with a gentleman, I saw over 50. But I'm guessing it's got, a, I have no idea. I don't, I probably close to 70 different birds that I've never seen before in my life. And then I think there was another question about invasive trees. Yes, yeah. regarding birds here at La Selva, there's a great many birds here. Uh, in Costa Rica, there's more birds in Costa Rica, which is a tiny little country about the size of the state of West Virginia. There are more species of birds, 800 and some species of birds here, than there are in the entire North America of US and Canada. So there's lots and lots of birds here. I think at La Selva, I'm not sure what the total number of species that has been seen here, but it's yeah, it's I think it's somewhere between four and five hundred. And the Christmas bird count here is very very high. It's usually three hundred and some birds that they see in one day. Uh, regarding this question about invasive species, uh, we don't have too many problems with trees. Uh, we're having trouble with a type of coffee. There's a couple of species of coffee that are used in Costa Rica, and there were some types that people tried to grow here, and they have become invasive, and they move, uh, they're moving through the forest. We've been trying to remove those. Another big problem is a banana species. It's a red banana, which is an ornamental that's grown here. Now, most of you, maybe you in South Florida, know that you can grow bananas in your backyard. And uh, those bananas never have seeds. But this banana that's growing here at La Selva, if you look at the picture you see in the map there, you can see there are two rivers that are joining together at the top of the map there. If you follow that river where the hand is, just upstream of that river, which is going down on the map, the red banana is invading all along the side of that river because the red banana does make seeds. Birds move the red bananas around, and it also moves in the water. So when the water floods and gets high, then it moves and drops banana plants around on the edge of the river. The, the question about lemurs, people, people maybe are interested in primates there here. Lemurs are only in Madagascar. But we have four species of monkeys that live here, three species of monkeys. We have howler monkeys, which make a noise kind of like a lion. And they communicate. They get mad when it rains on them. And they wake us up at 4 in the morning <laughs> and they're telling us what a beautiful day it is. There are white-faced monkeys, or capuchins, which are black with an all-white head. And they like palm trees, and they like to eat the fruits of palms. And then we have spider monkeys, which are bigger monkeys that travel around throughout the forest. In other parts of Costa Rica, there's another monkey, the little squirrel monkey, which is a tiny little monkey that they like to have uh, as pets on 
the little guys that play the accordion and have a little monkey pet. Those are often squirrel monkeys or the white-faced monkeys. But there are four species of monkeys here in Costa Rica. There's only three here at La Selva. And then um, Phil Kaler in Oregon had a question about um, who's at the top of the food chain and is the tower an e-bird hotspot? An e-bird hotspot. I'm not sure what an e-bird hotspot means. Uh, we actually do have internet on the top of the towers and some of the towers have a webcam and uh, we will look hard to try and find that web address and we could send that web address so that you could find that. And so that it, there's also audio recordings. People are recording what birds come to some of the towers just by listening to the sound. So they record the sound and the sounds are transmitted over the internet to Puerto Rico where somebody is working on them. I think they're also looking, uh, listening for bats and frogs also. Uh, top of the food chain. The top of the food chain here is the jaguar. Maybe. There's still some jaguars around, although La Selva is kind of a peninsula. We're kind of a, an extension of undisturbed forest in a large area where much of the forest has been cut down. But that's the terrestrial top of the food chain. And behind that we have mountain lions and people see mountain lions regularly. And we have big snakes. So we have the big boa constrictor which uh, can eat pretty good sized things. But in the water, we have crocodiles. <laughs> and uh, it used to be, I was going to say, the funnest thing that I do here at La Selva yeah. is I would get an air mattress and I'd walk upstream on the river. And you walk <laughs> 10 minutes and you'd throw the air mattress in the water and then float down for about a half an hour and then come out. But uh, in the last 10 years or so, crocodiles have moved into our floating spot and so we don't float in the river anymore because there's big crocodiles <laughs> there. Does Lolly have a live question? Um, can you tell us again how old is the La Salva base? How old is the La base? La Selva, I think, uh, was bought by Holdridge in the 1950s, but it became part of OTS in 19, the 1960s, I think 1964. Thank you. That's all from us. Thank you. That's all from us. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for your questions. I think we're going to uh, wrap this up now. and. Uh, we want to thank the ladies and the team down there in Costa Rica. Great to hear from you. And we'll turn it back. And um, thank you all for your questions. We will send out uh, the recording here and archive um, later today or tomorrow. And I'm, we're going to stop the um, recording here. And then if there's family or other folks that want to say hi and whatnot, you guys are welcome to do so. And also I'll turn the mic back over to you, Elizabeth. Okay, just thanks for coming. I hope you guys have a good day. Um, I know it's a little later for some and earlier for others, but here in Costa Rica, it's lunchtime. <laughs> and, and they're holding our lunch unless we get there before 1 o'clock. But no, I'm just kidding, sort of. But um, I, I really do appreciate everybody tuning in. I know it, it gets to be hard and a little bit challenging. And I'm very happy to be here.